And now, it's time for Mob Talk Radio with your host, Jeff Canarsie. So, all that being said, we are going to discuss part two of the Genovese crime family history. Uh, We talked a bit last week about how Joe Morello uh, began the Genovese crime family and about how Joe Masseria would end up uh, taking over only to be killed by Luciano and company uh, after after the agreement with Salvatore Maranzano. Uh, The one aspect I don't mention... Uh, which happened prior, or at least the one aspect I didn't mention last week, uh, was the uh, what happened prior to Masseria getting killed. Uh, I didn't probably mention it now that I think about it because it's very in-depth and I just didn't want to add too much time, and, and just time didn't allow me to go there. So we're going to take a step back for a second to May of 1929. Uh, the reason is because there was an important event that took place, which sort of confuses me at least in terms of i don't understand how masseria and maranzano didn't hear about it or maybe in fact they did uh and and maybe luciano just played them or placated them uh in any event we have to step back for a second keep in mind this is prior to luciano's betrayal of joe masseria uh so uh, this takes place in atlantic city uh, Meyer Lansky was getting married. His wedding was getting ready to take place. Or excuse me, he, Meyer Lansky had already gotten married, uh, and they were going to celebrate on the Jersey Shore in Atlantic City. Uh, Luciano, along with Lansky, uh, Frank Costello, and Johnny Torrio called a meeting of the who's who of organized crime. Uh, attending that meeting was Johnny Torrio, uh, Lucky Luciano, Frank Costello, Joe Adonis, Vito Genovese, all top members of the powerful Masseria family. Uh, Albert Anastasia, Frank Scalish, Vincent Mangano, uh, Tommy Lucchese, uh, Willie Moretti, uh, Meyer Lansky, Benny Siegel, uh, Louis Lepke Buckhalter, Jacob Shapiro, Abner Longy Zwillman, uh, Oni Madden, uh, Dutch Schultz, uh, and Frank Erickson, uh, and the list goes on, uh, Capone, Frank Nitti, Jake Guzik, uh, Frank Rio, uh, Frankie McErlane, Irving Waxy Gordon, uh, or excuse me, uh, Waxy Gordon, yes, uh, Harry Stromberg, uh, Max Hoff, uh, Charles Schwartz uh, from Cleveland. There was Modelitz, uh, Louis Rothkop, uh, and uh, the list just goes on and on and on. I'm going to give you a whole entire name uh, here in just a few minutes. Uh, also worth mentioning was uh, Santos Traficante Jr. Senior was there along with Sam Corolla of New Orleans. Now, Joe Bonanno was not invited to the meeting because nobody trusted Joe Bonanno, especially with his consistent switching on both sides. Uh, there was probably a real fear that Bonanno would open up his mouth. And, and there were some topics that were going to be discussed that would have a far reaching implication uh, not just for Masseria, but also Salvatore Maranzano. Now, neither Masseria nor Maranzano were invited to this event, and one would have to suggest that likely somebody assured them, uh, at least from that perspective, that maybe it was just it made more sense for them not to be there. I'm not sure how that all went down, but knowing what was discussed at the meeting, I would just have to uh, assume naturally that Luciano just placated them. Uh, like I said, it doesn't make a ton of sense to me, but you know, let's just leave that where it is for now. So Luciano and others knew, uh, that the meeting represented a few ideas. Uh, and there were a few changes that Luciano and others had in mind for organized crime in general. And they also knew that Masseria and Maranzano were not fond of 
uh, the Italians mixing with the Jewish and the Irish and anybody else. So that was always an ongoing issue. Uh, there were a few subjects to discuss at the meeting, obviously. Uh, the first was a plan for what the mafia would do to keep the money flowing in after prohibition ended. Uh, they knew the end at some point, the end would be in sight for prohibition. And they just wanted to ensure that they could still make money, but they worried that there were too many people fighting over bootlegging profits. Uh, just using an example, uh, Al Capone and what was going on in Chicago, the suggestion uh, that seemed to be put on the table was that everybody should use money from bootlegging to purchase breweries and distilleries so that when pro prohibition does end, they could legally make money. Uh, they could corner the market, so to speak. They also suggested that they should buy up bars and restaurants. Uh, that way they can just sort of have an, a monopoly uh, on the control of liquor. They talked about establishing imports and exports for liquor. Uh, and once again, it's just to sort of take over everything and, and have a monopoly. It gave them more money-making opportunities once prohibition sort of goes away. Uh, they would divide up territories into franchises so that everybody could make money, uh, and that murder would stop. Uh, in terms of gambling, uh, they wanted to exert full control over horse tracks, casinos, bookmaking, and gambling dens. Plans were laid out on behalf of New York and Chicago for a racing wire for horse gamblers with the Daily Racing Forum. So the Daily Racing Forum would come out in the papers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and this was just a simple way of, if you need to think about it, off-track betting in the way that off-track betting works these days. Um, they wanted to enable people who couldn't go to a track to be able to still bet. Uh, and, and so because Al Capone had a lot of control of the newspapers through Moses Annenberg, uh, it would make sense for Chicago to have a very active role in the idea. New York and Chicago would split the scheme together. From New York, it would be Frank Costello and Meyer Lansky who would handle things. And then on the flip side of that in Chicago, it would be Frank Erickson and Moses Annenberg that would take care of that. Uh, another topic on the list was the drama that Al Capone was responsible for. Uh, on one hand, you know, Capone did what he had to do in many instances, but after sheer, you know, after the sheer bloodshed that was the St. Valentine's Day massacre, it ended up bringing up way too much heat for organized crime. Capone's refusal to just sort of even out the field and negotiate was something that infuriated mafia leaders. They would rather he sit down and just make peace and cut up territories than to keep fighting. And that's not what uh, Capone really wanted to do. Uh, Capone uh, sort of just refused to even think about peace, uh, negotiate with something that was not in Capone's sort of uh, dialogue. Uh, so what ends up happening is Johnny Torrio and Lucky Luciano explained to Al Capone that he would have to do something to get the heat off the mafia. There was just too much heat on them. The suggestion was that he take a small pinch, go to jail, and naturally the heat would sort of die down. And this was not something that Al Capone thought he needed to do, and it's not something he wanted to do. And they argued back and forth over over that idea. Uh, specifically, he argued with Luciano and Torrio about it. Uh, it was Luciano who pretty much just sat there and explained, look, you know, this is non-negotiable. Uh, and you can either do as we're asking you to do, or there's other things that we can do to re rectify the situation, which is more or less by killing Al Capone. Uh, the last major topic was ridding themselves of Maranzano and Masseria. Luciano wanted assurances that if anyone who supported them got in the way, that other bosses would be willing to step up and take take these motherfuckers out. Uh, you know, Maranzano and Masseria were greedy. They refused to stop fighting, and Luciano and others felt that they could organize under one umbrella and then find a more consistent way to handle disagreements and beefs focusing on money, not murder, uh, and that the mafia would be better off if they did that. Uh, the group agreed pretty much with everything that was on board, and one of the final things that Luciano would address was the disbanding of the Bugs and Meyer mob, and the reason why he wanted to do that was they were moving to a more – uh, a national crime syndicate so that everybody would, would sort of have their place. Uh, and I think that he also did that because he wanted to bring in Siegel as an uh, on the record associate, and he wanted to elevate Meyer Lansky to a consigliere type of role for the family. Uh, but the Bugs and Meyer mob would actually disband and sort of become what, what we know as Murder Inc. Uh, so here is a full list of the attendees. Uh, so Nucky Johnson, who represented South Jersey, uh, Johnny Torrio, uh, Lucky Luciano, Frank Costello, Joe Adonis, Vito Genovese, 
uh, Willie Moretti, Frank uh, Mangano, uh, Frank Scalish, Albert Anastasia, Tommy Lucchese, Meyer Lansky, Bugsy Siegel, uh, Louis Lepke, Jacob Shapiro, Dutch Schultz, Abner Zwillman, Oni Madden, Frank Erickson, Tommy Gagliano, and Carlo Gambino. From Chicago, we had Al Capone, Frank Nitti, Jake Guzik, uh, Frank Rio, and Frank McCurlane. Uh, from Philadelphia, Waxy Gordon, Max Hoff, uh, Harry Stromberg, Irving Bitts, uh, Charles Schwartz, Samuel Lazar. From Cleveland, Mo Dalitz, uh, Louis Rothkop, and Leo Berkowitz. From Detroit, uh, Joseph Bernstein and Abe Bernstein. From Kansas City, Giovanni Lazia. Uh, from New England, Charlie Solomon, uh, Frank Cucciari. Uh, Wait, I read that wrong. Sorry. Uh, from New England, we had Frank Morelli uh, and Frank uh, Cucciara. From Florida, Santo Traficante. From Louisiana, Sam Carolla, who was coming from the Matranga uh, Giacona crime family. Uh, so after the conference ends, Capone does what he's told. Uh, knowing, knowing wherever he went, the cops were going to harass him and going to frisk him. He ends up putting a gun in his coat. As he arrives in Philadelphia, he stopped, he's frisked. Uh, and then charged with carrying a firearm. Uh, he'd get about a year in prison. He would be sentenced to a year in prison, but he only spent a few couple, a couple of months away before returning to Chicago as it allowed for what Luciano expected and wanted was the heat began to die down. So we're going to fast forward back to where we left off. So hopefully you didn't get confused. Uh, what we just talked about was prior to Maranzano and Masseria getting clipped. Uh, so we're going to take it right from after Mar, uh, excuse me, right after Mar Masseria gets clipped. So Luciano is handed all of Masseria's rackets, which was a part of the agreement. Uh, and Maranzano begins to change a couple of things. Uh, he ends up putting Lucky Luciano in as sort of the second in command. We could, we could assume it was an underboss, but everybody was going to have their own kind of families. But, uh, you know, as Maranzano wants to be the boss of bosses, he needs a number two, and his number two would have been Lucky Luciano. So one of the first things that Maranzano does is he begins to reorganize all of the criminal gangs and he arranges them into five families. A lot of people think that Luciano was responsible for that, and he really wasn't. It was actually Maranzano. Uh, and if you really want to get technical about it, it was really Ciro Terranova who came up with the idea for five families. So the, the, the first one to sort of put it together was Maranzano. Uh, the five families would be headed by Lucky Luciano, Joe Profaci, Tommy Gagliano, Vincent Mangano, and Salvatore Maranzano. Uh, each family would have a boss, an underboss, a consigliere, and captains. Uh, Maranzo, Maranzato, excuse me, Maranzano made a rule that you had to be 100% Italian to even be a made guy. So this is where it first comes from, uh, at least in America. Uh, while associates didn't matter what their ethnic background was, but you know what's funny about that is, is is he consistently picked on Frank Costello for being Calabrian. He didn't like anybody that wasn't from Sicily, so I, I think in, in terms of just associates, I think he just really didn't give a shit, but he probably, and I know for a fact, had an issue with uh, people of the Jewish faith being associates. Uh, so, uh, in a move that probably didn't shock a whole lot of them, Maranzano would name himself boss of bosses at a meeting uh, in Whippingers Falls, New Jersey, excuse me, New York, uh, he would further raise eyebrows when he began to take away uh, lucrative rackets from other families and assigned it to his own family. Uh, so in other words, uh, you know, you guys should be fucking grateful. I'm even allow you to have a family. Meanwhile, I'm going to take all the lucrative ra rackets and you guys are going to be stuck with nickels and dimes. And, and that's sort of uh, what Maranzano does. Uh, Maranzano was a very one-way thinker. He didn't like anybody who wasn't Sicilian. Uh, so people like Costello, like I said earlier, who had done his bidding and committed murder for Maranzano uh, were left aghast when Maranzano refused to even talk to anybody that wasn't Sicilian like human beings. Uh, the only crime that Costello ever committed was that he was Calabrian and not Sicilian. And that's the way that Maranzano treated people. And it was the viewpoint of Luciano and Genovese and others that it shouldn't matter where and f where the fuck in Italy you came from, as long as you're Italian. Uh, but it was something that Maranzano was against, and he made that well known. So Luciano and others begin to see that Maranzano was almost worse than Masseria in every sense, uh, especially as far as greed and ego. Luciano would then sort of start meeting with Meyer Lansky and Irish hoodlums and others to sort of conduct business because Luciano saw things as if I can make money here with these guys, who the fuck cares what their ethnic back background is or what the heritage is? I'm just going to try to fake, fucking make some money. 
Uh, and Maranzano didn't like that. Uh, it made him very angry. He didn't trust anybody that didn't think like him, didn't trust anybody that wasn't from his town or, excuse me, his village in Italy. Uh, and Maranzano and Luciano bumped heads on structure about how the mafia should be run. Luciano felt that a boss should not be seen and that the underboss should run the day-to-day -day operations and that captains and soldiers would handle the brunt of the family business, and that's what a boss should do. A boss should also isolate himself, but Maranzano was old school, and he didn't see it that way at all. Uh, by September of 1931, Maranzano ends up getting fed up with Luciano and his ideals. He starts to hear rumors of meetings, and I think he probably didn't realize in actuality how powerful Lucky Luciano was, but if I had to use it to a common theme or a common example, I uh, think of Nicky Scarfo and Salvi Testa. Okay, Salvi Testa is an up-and-comer. A lot of people like him. The press is saying a lot of stuff about him, and Nicky Scarfo begins to sort of get that tickle on his asshole about, wait a second here, I'm the fucking boss. This guy's getting all the fucking accolades. Is this something that I need to worry about down the line? And I think that that's the position that, that Maranzano was actually in. Uh, I don't think that he realized that others in the mafia were tired of being starved and treated like shit. I think Maranzano probably suspected that Luciano had favor with other bosses, uh, and he decides to be preemptive. Uh, he would actually sentence Luciano to death, <coughs> excuse me, and he would go to Tommy Lucchese and tell Tommy Lucchese to go out and hire Mad Dog Call to get the job done. Uh, Vincent Mad Dog Call got really his start with Dutch Schultz. Uh, his main role for Schultz was that of an enforcer, uh, ensuring that every, anybody who purchased alcohol only bought from Dutch Schultz. In one case, Schultz whacked Anthony Borello, who was the owner of a speakeasy who refused to buy uh, Dutch Schultz bootlegged liquor. Uh, Mary Smith, who was a dance hall hostess, was also killed the same sort of way. Uh, Call was not the type of guy who would fuck around. Uh, Call would end up being arrested for those murders, but Schultz would use his money and power and influence to get those charges dropped. Cole was a valued guy for Schultz, uh, a bit of a maniac, but also a bit reckless. Uh, Schultz would also use him as a hitman. Uh, but in 1929, Cole does something that rubs a lot of people the wrong way, and it wouldn't be the first thing he did. Uh, Cole ended up robbing a dairy in the Bronx, which was protected and sort of controlled by other gangs, uh, and he stole $17,000. Schultz was pissed off with the whole entire thing. Uh, he sits down with him and just kind of explains, listen, this belonged to somebody else. This is a problem. And Cole doesn't want to hear anything Schultz has to say and actually demands, I want to be half your partner in everything you're doing or else. Obviously, Schultz isn't going to agree to that, uh, and so pretty much war would be on, so to speak. So uh, by January of 1930, Cole had left Schultz and, and sort of foam, formed his own criminal gang. Then he begins moving into Schultz's territory, uh, knocking off deliveries and, and some other stuff, and so both sides start shooting. Uh, Schultz would end up killing Cole's brother, Peter, on May 30th of 31 uh, in a drive-by shooting. Uh, according to reports, Cole went absolutely fucking berserk. And the following three weeks, all Cole wanted to do was kill people. And he ended up killing three of Schultz's guys. Uh, so the war was ongoing for months. And at the same time, this is going on. You also have the Castamolare bullshit going on too, as well as in, in Brooklyn. Uh, in June, Cole and his crew broke into a garage owned by Schultz and destroyed 120 vending machines and 10 trucks. So the war would continue. Vincent Cole and his gang, killed approximately 20 of Schultz's men. Uh, to finance his new gang, uh, Cole kidnapped gangsters, held them for ransom, uh, and he knew that the victims would not report the kidnappings to the cops uh, because they would have a hard time explaining to the Bureau of uh, Internal Revenue why the ransom cash had not been reported as income. Uh, one of Cole's best-known victims was gambler Georgie uh, Damage, who was a close associate of Oni Madden, who was the boss of of the Irish mob in Hell's Kitchen. Uh, according to at least one account, uh, Cole telephoned Damage and asked to meet with him. When Damage arrived at the meeting place, Cole kidnapped him at gunpoint. Uh, he released Damage 18 hours later after receiving the ransom paper. Excuse me, ransom payment. On July 28th of 1931, Cole allegedly participated in a kidnapping attempt that resulted in the shooting death of a child. Uh, Cole's target was a bootlegger by the name of Joseph Rao, uh, who was a Schultz underling who was pretty much just hanging out outside of a social club. Uh, several kids were running around playing outside of this place. Uh, and the car shows up. Several men 
reached out the windows with shotguns and Tommy guns and just started lighting the fucking place up. Uh, four children were wounded. One was killed in that attack. Uh, and that was just something that not only outraged the mafia, but outraged politicians and it outraged the police. It was the incept- He would eventually be arrested and jailed and tried for that crime, but he was acquitted. Uh, it was also in September of that year that Maranzano hires call to kill Luciano through Tommy Lucchese. So with Maranzano uh, wanting the head of Luciano on a plate, Tommy Lucchese was tasked with setting it up. Uh, Lucchese had no interest in helping Maranzano, and he tells Luciano pretty much what the deal is. you got a contract on your head. Cole's going to kill you. So Luciano realizes that Cole, who who was no fan of Italians, by the way, was a, a trigger-happy fucking nutcase. Uh, and so Luciano decides to move on Maranzano. But there's a problem. The problem is, is that Maranzano knew many of the guys that Luciano had around him and underneath of him. So he needed a plan that would allow him to get that done without tipping off Maranzano or his men. Uh, so Maranzano makes a call. And he ends up telling Luciano, I want to meet you and Vito Genovese in my office. And whether or not that was a legitimate meeting or not, I speculate it probably wasn't. But then again, who's going to kill people in their fucking office? Uh, But Luciano sort of sees this as going to be Maranzano's attempt to kill him. So Luciano ends up saying, fuck this. I need to do something now. (coughs) So Luciano goes to Meyer Lansky and Benny Siegel. And he explains to them, I need some guys from your people, Jewish people, to hit these fucking guys. Because if they recognize anybody that comes in as being represented by me, they're going to pull guns and we're never going to get this done. So four Jewish gangsters along with Tommy Lucchese walked to Marnes on his building on 230 Park Avenue, which would become one of the Helmsley buildings uh, decades later. So they entered the office and immediately disarmed the men. Uh, and what they do is they pose that they're government agents. And so naturally they walk in with fake badges, look like agents. They take the weapons, that blah, 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 blah. And so they enter the office and, uh, Maranzano has no clue what's going on. Tommy Lucchese ends up pulling out a stiletto. He walks into Maranzano's office around the desk and begins to stab Maranzano repeatedly in the legs, the arms, and then he cuts his face wide open. Shortly after that, he pulls out pistols along with the other four, Uh, gangsters and they lit Maranzano the fuck up killing him where he sat so uh, to ensure uh, and and this is a debated uh, amongst mob scholars but I believe it to be really the the, the, the true case here Uh, Luciano uh, then orders the deaths of two of Maranzano's allies Samuel Monaco and Louis Russo Uh, they were found floating in the Newark Bay obviously there were signs they had been tortured for days Meanwhile, at the same time this happens, uh, Joe Saragusa, who was the Pittsburgh crime family boss, was shot to death in his home. Uh, and then on October 15th, the disappearance of Jay Artizone, excuse me, Joe Artizone, who was head of the Los Angeles crime family at the time, just disappeared. Uh, many have argued that Luciano didn't call or make that move, that there were other situations that were going on. And there is truth to that, that there were other situations going on. But I personally believe that Luciano looked at this as, okay, well, Maranzano's got some supporters. These guys carry a little weight, so let's get rid of them too. I've always believed that that was the case. Now, whether or not that's really true or not, I couldn't tell you. That's just my speculation. So with Maranzano off planet Earth, Uh, Luciano becomes the most powerful boss in American crime. Uh, His crime family was a wealthy one. They controlled gambling, extortion, bookmaking, loan sharking, and drug trafficking. Uh, Luciano became very influential in labor unions uh, and controlled the Manhattan waterfront completely, garbage hauling, construction, and the garment district, which they still own to this day. Uh, Luciano uh, could have been like Maranzano in a sense, and he could have named himself boss of bosses. And not a lot of people would have gone against him, but I think that Luciano knew that that would be the wrong move to make uh, and that it was perhaps Maranzano and Masseria's biggest ego-filled mistake that they made. So not long after Luciano gets rid of Maranzano, uh, Luciano changes a bit of the structure of the mafia. The first thing he does is he bans the boss of bosses title. Uh, 
he didn't feel like uh, also at the same time he didn't feel like a making ceremony was needed he thought that that was old school sicilian traditions and they didn't think that they needed it and genovese argues with him that they do need it and the reason why they do need it is because it keeps guys in line they know the rules and they know the penalties and those are the rules which are buying them to this thing of ours uh, so Luciano says, you know what, you're, you're probably right. Let's just keep that the way it is. And that's the way that they went with it. Uh, Luciano would keep the formation of the five families uh, and would install a commission, uh, which would oversee beefs and keep other rogue families in check. Luciano also arranged, uh, rearranged his own crime family a bit. He would... Uh, he would be the boss. He would name Vito Genovese's underboss, Frank Costello as his consigliere, and Joe Adonis, uh, Trigger Mike Coppola, Anthony Strollo, and Willie Moretto, and Anthony Carfano as his captains. Uh, Lansky would be promoted to a consigliere type of role within the family, and Siegel would become an on-the-record associate. Uh, in 1931, Luciano headed to Chicago. Uh, and the reason why he goes to Chicago is to further explain the role of the new commission that he sort of wants to have installed. Luciano wanted everybody to have a say, but more specifically, uh, he wanted the old days to be simply the old days. It did not want families beefing over money. Uh, Luciano would establish which family controlled which territory, what was theirs, what wasn't theirs, uh, and it was composed of representatives from the five families of New York City. It also included the Buffalo, Buffalo crime family and the Chicago Mafia. Later on, Philadelphia and Detroit would be added with smaller families being represented by the commission family. So in other words, uh, Philadelphia has, at one point was on the commission. Now they are represented by the Genovese crime family. That's just the way it worked. Uh, also, there would be someone on the commission, likely Meyer Lansky, who would be sort of a representative for Jewish criminal organizations in New York as well. So for Luciano, it was all systems go. Uh, then 1935 happened. Uh, it would be the first time that the commission, uh, which was newly formed, would have to act on something. Uh, Dutch Schultz uh, was having a major, major fucking problem with special prosecutor Thomas Dewey. Uh, Dewey was hell-bent on going after Dutch Schultz. Uh, the first move by Dewey was to go after Schultz for tax evasion. Schultz would be indicted in 1933, and he would take off and go on the lamb. He would return in 1934 and surrender. Uh, he, would, he would end up going on trial, but it would be a hung jury. Uh, Dewey heard whispers that Schultz had bribed jurors, and so he retries the case. So while gearing up for trial, Schultz would spend money on the people in the town. I think it was in Malone, New York. Uh, he would buy presents for sick kids, pay sick kids' bills, pay other people's bills, hand out money. And it was all an effort to sway to sway a jury because somebody in this town would end up on the jury and if he could make things look good it was good for him uh and it was the right move as he ends up getting acquitted of those charges a new york city mayor at the time fiorello laguardia was so fucking irate that he ordered that schultz be arrested if he's even spotted in new york city and because of that it sort of forces dutch schultz to move his base of operations to newark new jersey uh schultz uh just because of the, just the re repeated fucking indictments was forced to keep spending money to defend himself uh and he requests from his numbers runners that they take a pay cut uh and if they didn't then he was going to fucking kill them uh and it created a massive backlash and a problem for dutch schultz so for months he ends up losing a ton of money as a result the number of runners refusing to work so schultz had no choice but to back down from that sort of statement uh but the damage to his reputation uh was was ruined uh bo weinberg who was number two under schultz was fed up with the whole thing he saw the enormous amounts of money that schultz was keeping for himself uh and using for his defense fund uh and he ends up going to see longies wilman who at the time was running new jersey's wilman offered his advice and said you know you can do what you want but let me reach out to lucky luciano uh weinberg saw dutch schultz's operation pretty much as his uh, especially if Schultz ends up getting a, uh, convicted of tax evasion. So he sort of begins to posture himself, which was the wrong fucking move. Weinberg requested from Luciano that he get a percentage of the rackets, but he wanted complete control of whatever was left of Dutch Schultz's crime family. Uh, Luciano informs Weinberg that it was his intention to break up the gang and evenly distribute all of the rackets that Schultz had under his control to the five families. Uh, Schultz... Uh, uh, so 
what ends up happening is, is Schultz kind of gets word of what this is going on. Uh, Bo Weinberg really didn't like hearing this, but Schultz sort of gets word of what's happening. And he ends up trying to cozy up to Luciano. He even converts to Roman Catholicism when he was Jewish. Uh, and everybody expected Schultz to be convicted, but he was acquitted. Uh, and Schultz, knowing he has a problem with Luciano and hearing all of these things on the back end that Luciano is going to take his rackets, uh, he had, sets a meeting with Luciano and the commission to explain the situation and to also get an explanation about all the rumors he was hearing. Uh, Luciano basically tells them that, look, all they were doing was looking after his rackets in case he ended up going away uh, and they were trying to protect his interests. I don't think Schultz necessarily bought all of that. But what other choice did he have? Luciano would, would would further that and say, look, if you went to jail, you know, once you get out, your rackets would be given back to you and whatever interest there was, you'd be paid in full. Uh, but Luciano was placating Schultz. and It was going to be a takeover. Uh, and I think that Schultz likely probably at that point knew something wasn't right. So a month after his acquittal, Bo Weinberg suddenly disappears. Uh, there was wide speculation that either he was killed by Schutz, uh, excuse me, by Schultz or Luciano, and it would make sense because Weinberg had made overtures about taking over the family. Luciano basically told him, "Go fuck yourself." I'm sure Schultz heard about it, so maybe in the back of Schultz's mind, he thought, "Let me take out Weinberg, so I don't have that problem." But it would make almost more sense that Luciano had it done uh, just to keep control, uh, because I don't think Luciano wanted to go to war with Weinberg. Uh, and so uh, Schultz also at this meeting requests something of the commission. He requests that Dewey uh, be killed. Uh, Luciano would argue with him that it was a simple tax case and that killing a special prosecutor would unleash a, a torrent of law enforcement problems. Uh, and the commission declined to say uh, yes. They said, no, we're not going to kill Dewey. So Schultz is enraged and he tells Luciano, all right, I'm going to go fucking kill him anyway. And he storms out. Uh, and I think that Luciano probably just chalked a lot of that up to, look, he's pissed, he's venting, whatever. I have my plans, he has his. But then Albert Anastasia approaches Lucky Luciano and he explains that Schultz had him watching Dewey's house, watching every move. There was going to be a murder. Uh, and Luciano at this point says, okay, now we got a fucking problem. He calls a commission meeting and it was decided that Dutch Schultz was going to be killed. And they assigned that murder to Louis Lepke. So on October 23rd, of 1935 Schultz was eating dinner uh, at the palace chop house restaurant, which was off 12 East street, uh, excuse me, 12 East park street, Newark, New Jersey. Uh, He was with Otto Berman and Abe Landau. Uh, Also his, his bodyguard, Bernard Lulu Rosencrantz. What a fucking name. Hey, Rosencrantz, go fuck your mother uh, was there. So Schultz ends up getting up and going to the bathroom and Charlie the Bug Workman and Mindy Weiss would enter the chop house and make their way to the restroom. Uh, they would end up firing multiple shots, not just in uh, the dining area, but they would walk right into the fucking bathroom and start pumping bullets into fucking Dutch Schultz, too. Uh, they Berman would end up collapsing immediately. Landau was shot in the fucking neck. Uh, Rosencrantz was shot repeatedly at point blank range. Uh, despite their injuries, uh, both gangsters sitting at the table were were ended up being able to get up on their feet, pull a gun, and just start shooting. Uh, but it just wasn't going to work out uh, because at the end of the day, they would end up all dying of their uh, wounds. So for Luciano, it was time to move forward. They took care of business. But what he didn't expect was that Dewey, who was hell-bent on going after Dutch Schultz, was now going to set his sights on him. Uh, And he began peering into Luciano's activities. The Luciano crime family had begun, and not really begun, they'd already taken over all of the prostitution rackets in the city. In June of 1935, Governor Herbert Lehman would appoint Thomas Dewey as a U.S. attorney, and his direct job would be to combat organized crime in New York City. Dewey then would bring in an assistant by the name of Eunice Carter, who had been spearheading an investigation into Luciano, specifically into the combination or the combine, which was the prostitution ring. Uh, Carter would then investigate the flow of money into the New York, New Jersey prostitution network. And then she began to build a case on a prostitution racketeering founded on evidence from wiretaps and interviews with prostitutes. 
On February 2nd of 1936, Dewey would authorize Carter to raid 200 brothels in Manhattan and Brooklyn, which would earn him nationwide recognition as a gangbuster or a, a prosecutor tough on organized crime. Uh, Carter would then take measures to prevent police corruption from impeding those raids. She would assign 160 cops outside of the vice squad to conduct the raids because the vice squad was on the take. Uh, the officers would then be instructed to wait on street corners until they received their orders, which would only be seven to 10 minutes before the raids actually took place. It was just a way to ensure that Luciano uh, and everybody involved didn't know it was coming. 10 men and a hundred women would get arrested. Uh, however, Unlike previous vice raids, the arrestees were not released. They weren't even given uh, a bond. Under normal circumstances in those years, you could get a simple bond and get out. But the judge, for some reason in this case, uh, didn't want to allow them to even be able to get out. So the bond was $10,000 a person, and that was way beyond what anybody could afford. And it was a way to keep them in and get them talking. Uh and so Eunice Carter had built like sort of a rapport with a lot of the prostitutes, the madams, uh, and they start talking. They say they were beaten, beaten up by the mafia, abused by the mafia, uh, and everybody started giving up Lucky Luciano. Well, he's the guy that secretly runs this. Uh, three, of the, three of the prostitutes implicated Luciano as the ringleader uh, who made the collections. Uh, Luciano associate uh, Dave Patillo was in charge of the prostitution ring in New York. And any money that Luciano received was from Batillo. And that's sort of uh, the roadmap that they use. So in late March of 36, Luciano receives a tip. He's going to be arrested. And he takes off to Hot Springs, Arkansas. Uh, but unfortunately for him, uh, there was a detective in New York City uh, that recognized Luciano and notified uh, Dewey of what was going on in Arkansas. So on April 3rd, Luciano gets arrested in Arkansas on a criminal warrant from New York. Uh, the next day in New York, Dewey... Uh, indicted Luciano and his accomplices on 60 counts of compulsory prostitution. Uh, Luciano's lawyers in Arkansas then began a fierce battle against extradition. On April 6th, Oni Madden, the one-time owner of the Cotton Club, offered a $50,000 bribe to the Attorney General of Arkansas, a man by the name of Carl Bailey, to facilitate uh, Luciano's case. However, Bailey refused the bribe and then immediately reported it to Dewey. So on April 17th, after all of Luciano's sort of legal options had been exhausted, uh, Arkansas authorities handed him to NYPD detectives for transport by train back to New York for a trial. Uh, when the train reached St. Louis, the detectives and Luciano changed trains. And all of this was due to they were afraid the mob was going to step in and try to kill people to get Luciano uh, sort of out of the problem. Um Anyway, so he arrives in New York on April 18th of that year, uh, and Luciano is put in jail without bail. On May 13th of 36, Luciano's uh, pandering trial begins. Uh, Dewey would prosecute that case, and Eunice Carter would build the case against Lucky Luciano. He accused Luciano of being a part of the master, excuse me, the massive, <laughs> you guys know what I almost just said. <laughs> uh, they accused him of being a massive prostitution ringleader, uh, known as the combination. Uh, during that trial, Dewey exposed Luciano for lying on the witness stand through direct testimony and records of telephone calls. Uh, Luciano had no explanation for why his federal income tax records claimed he only made 22000 a year, while he obviously was a wealthy man. Uh, Dewey then ruthlessly pressed Luciano on his long arrest record and his relationship with well-known gangsters like Maranzano, Masseria, uh, Ciro Terranova, Dutch Shelton, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. On June 7th, Luciano was convicted on 62 counts of compulsory prostitution. On June 18th, he was sentenced to 30 to 50 years in state prison, along with Batillo and others. So Luciano's gone. He's got to head off to prison. Uh, he would attempt to run his crime family from prison while he was filing those appeals. Uh, and it proved to be just too much for him. It was a pain in the ass. And in his absence... He would elevate Vito Genovese as acting boss. Uh, he would elevate Frank Costello as his underboss. And it wouldn't really last long because we know Vito Genovese ends up getting indicted for murder in 1937 and takes off to Naples. And that would lead a void that would lead uh, sort of a void in power. And so in his absence, Luciano names Frank Costello to the boss and Luciano's cousin, Willie Moretti, as the underboss. 
Uh, and so that's sort of how Luciano came to power, and Luciano lost his power. Now, Luciano still remained a lot of res- uh, maintained a lot of respect, a lot of authority, and a lot of power. Uh, but the problem from prison is you can only do but so much. Uh, and as much as we talk about things, and, and those who know this story know where this is going to go, because we know that Genovese is going to take off to Naples. We know that Frank Costello is going to take over. We know that Vito Genovese is going to come back. We know that they're going to have uh, the Havana Conference. And so there's a lot of moving spokes and things that are, are going to happen uh, on next week's show, uh, which will be part three of the Genovese crime film. Like, this is probably going to end up being l- legitimately, legitimately uh, six shows. Easy. Uh, but we're going to try to keep it to just how just the entomology of it where they began and how they end uh and i think you know anybody that that's listens to this show knows you know we've talked about lucky luciano a lot on this show and a lot of different things but what i want to try to do differently because sometimes you know we we nitpick vito genovese a little bit but i think we have to get into the politics of it and so part three is going to be the politics of it uh not only are we going to talk about uh world war ii uh, and Dewey literally going to fucking Luciano for help with the ports in return for getting out of prison. Uh, we're going to talk about that, but we're going to talk about the, some of the politics of this. Because even though at times we've talked about Vito Genovese being a fucking nut job and a crazy fuck, there was a lot of things that maybe Vito Genovese should have gotten that he didn't. Uh, and, and we'll sort of go back and forth on that and debate that because that's an interesting facet to all this because what's about to happen now is going to change the crime family completely. It is going to change the direction that they're going now is they're using illegitimate money uh, to uh, – they're using illegitimate money to build legitimate uh, businesses. They're controlling everything from the ports to the garment district to everything else. And when Frank Costello steps into the role, it's just more of the same. But the difference is, is that Costello uses his abilities as a a counselor and he uses his abilities to talk and be calm and to bridge gaps and to to form partnerships to move into the political realm, which is what protects the Genovese crime family for a long time. And that the second the Vito Genovese returns and starts his shit, because we know he's going to start his shit. It starts to go downhill. And there are things that Genovese could have done differently that we'll discuss. There's things that Luciano could have done differently. But by all accounts and and everything that we always talk about on this show, the trajectory of the Genovese crime family is about to change permanently. So uh, all that being said, that is part two of the Genovese crime family. We will be back next week with an all new show. More things to talk about, but we are going to cover part three of the Genovese crime family history. And I just wanted to thank everybody for listening in uh, and for anybody that continues to, to, to pay for the site.